I'm Stephanie Vaughn. I am the co-founder and president of the Morgan Leary Vaughn Fund. My twin son, Seamus and Morgan, were born at 28 weeks, one day, gestation, and at four days old, uh, Morgan was diagnosed with necrotizing enterocolitis and had to be transferred from Bridgeport Hospital in Bridgeport, Connecticut to Yale New Haven Children's Hospital for a surgical consult. Uh, what we didn't know at the time was that a surgical consult um, in essence meant that he had to undergo exploratory surgery. Um, and uh, 20 centimeters or about eight inches of his small intestine was resected or cut out during the surgery. Um, and for his age and size, that was about 20% of his small intestine. Morgan is considered an anomaly. Um, he developed neck at four days old. Typically, the babies are a little bit older than that, and it's when you start to introduce feeds that they um, end up developing neck. And um, my gut feeling is that there's something uh, genetic, a genetic predisposition, that there was something else um, going on ahead of him being fed and developing neck. I have two thoughts. Uh, my first thought is that I hope we can get to families and um, parents to be before they're in a scenario like we were um, with, a, with an immediate diagnosis and an immediate urgent need for surgery. Um, I think that awareness comes through education and um, it can be very powerful and it can uh, plant a seed in you that you may never need that information but hearing it, knowing it, um, I think can put people somewhat at ease um, and understand there's a lot of variables and a lot of risk factors for premature babies. Um, you know, breathing, heart, and then intestine is a huge one. Um, and we were never made aware of that until um, his surgery. And then I think my second one is um, early detection and diagnosis and intervention because I truly believe that um, I truly believe that Morgan is a true testament to early diagnosis and intervention. Um, I think that all the stars aligned for him. Um, someone caught this really early and they dealt with it really quickly and they got him in the right place at the right time with the right surgeon who had decades of experience with this disease and we knew nothing about it and he put us at ease and he saved our son. <laughs> I think I've said it several times, probably not to him directly, but um, he did, he saved. <sighs> Sorry, we could edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> he saved our son and we didn't even really know that he needed to be saved because we really didn't understand um, the dire situation that he was in and the level of um, care that he received and that we received and the understanding that we did have and um, the rapidness that uh, they took over and um, got him where he needed to be. When we say that we know we're lucky, we really, we really do know that we're lucky because 50% of the kids that are in Morgan's situation don't survive. And we didn't even know that until after the fact. So every time it crosses my mind that he couldn't, he could possibly not be here, it's a, it's a constant reminder. And there are so many families that don't have their babies and right place, right time, right scenario, we have our son. And that's what I want for any baby that is diagnosed with neck. It's not new at all. Um, there have been research studies and publications since the 1960s about this disease. 
um, with the frequency of um, prematurity and the increase with um, infertility assistance, which we had, um, you get more multiples, which means you have smaller babies that are maybe born even more preterm. Um, so really the number one risk for neck is being born preterm or a, a low birth weight. But really any newborn under five and a half pounds has an increased risk just because um, the intestine, the gut is immature and the baby's just, they're, you know, their whole body, they're just immature. <laughs> Neck is the second leading cause of death in premature infants. Um, it affects about 9,000 babies in the U.S. every year. Um, for very low birth weight babies like Morgan who weigh under three pounds, the uh, risk for neck is about one in 14. And uh, the costs associated with neck um, easily run 500 million to a billion dollars a year in the US. And that data is probably a little outdated. Neck is a rare disease. In the US, that means that there's less than 200,000 cases um, in the country. And um, I think because it's predominantly premature babies, um, just by virtue of the number of babies that are born prematurely every year and the percentage that can potentially develop neck, it fits into the rare disease category. Um, but it's a little bit like, um, I liken it to a cancer where the treatment um, if it's surgical, is to cut the damaged intestine out and then effectively the baby is cured because they no longer have necrotizing enterocolitis. Um, but NAC is the uh, leading cause of short gut disease in infants, which is if you lose, I believe, more than 50% of your small intestine and it affects absorption, um, nutrition, weight gain, um, and it, it, that in and of itself is a secondary rare disease, and it has lifelong implications for the baby. From a surgical perspective, he was released from his surgeon eight days after he came home from the hospital. So he um, had a first surgery and had 20% uh, of his small intestine removed. And then about six weeks later, he had a secondary surgery to reconnect the healthy intestine. Uh, so when he came home, he had a huge um, shark-like scar on his uh, stomach. But other than that, he wasn't attached to anything. He didn't need supplemental feedings. He didn't have a feeding tube. Um, none of the things that they would, would have in the NICU. Um, and at eight days old, we had a follow up with the surgeon and he said to treat him as normal. So there was no reason to believe that he would have complications from the surgery, meaning physical um, complications like at the surgical site. But he was in the hospital for 109 days and he was developmentally delayed in all aspects as most preemies are and the uh, earlier the more premature they are the longer they're going to stay in the hospital and what we were told initially was um, both boys would likely stay in, t in the hospital until around their due date and they were born at 28 weeks which is right about six months so the likelihood was that they would stay in the hospital for about three months um, his brother came home the day after his original due date. So like right on target for that three months. And Morgan came home um, three weeks after that. And we had, um, based on his prematurity and his gestational age, 28 weeks, um, 
he qualified for home nursing care um, visits weekly while they monitored his weight until he uh, got to be about 10 pounds. So we didn't have to run him back and forth to the, uh, to the doctors for you know weight checks and things like that. And then he also qualified for birth to three services, which is in-home support um, for the caregivers, parents, um, for physical therapy, occupational therapy, kind of um, giving you the exercises and the tools to engage them in a way that's gonna support their development and kind of catching them up. Um, so we had that and at 20, seven months, he had his 30 to 36 month assessment at Bridgeport Hospital where he was born um, at their NICU follow-up. And he met all his milestones for 30 to 36 months at 27 months, um, including coping skills, which is sort of a, a, a nod to the fact that he was premature, that he had developed good coping skills. Um, I guess it's not typical for them to be on par with those types of skills. Um, and then as he got a little bit older, we went to preschool and um, at three in Connecticut, the birth to three transitions to um, special ed services through the town, through your school. Um, and when they came to the house, the woman that was interviewing us thought that he was really, really smart. So she didn't see all of the little um, idiosyncrasies with him. And so we did not get support for a good year um, between three and four because she thought that his intelligence um, superseded his need for assistance um, in school. So then at four, <laughs> we, we had gone back to them once, come back to them again, and she basically said, you're just gonna keep coming back until we give him services, so we're just gonna give you services. He was you know, sort of borderline um, to be required to give it to him, but as a, a fierce advocate, we got him services, which he, ended up with speech therapy, um, occupational therapy. And then when he turned six, um, they reevaluate. So they evaluate at three and then they reevaluate at six. And he was graduated out of services because they no longer felt that, that he needed it. Um, and we were moving from Connecticut to Texas. So he was disqualified he graduated, he was disqualified for services right before we moved. So when we moved to Texas, he wasn't getting any services. Um, and this was kindergarten. So the second half of um, kindergarten, his teacher noticed that he was um, stabilizing himself to write. Um, he'd sort of tuck his legs like behind his chair to, to like stabilize his core um, to give him enough balance and coordination to be able to write. And she thought that he was um, lacking with um, the strength to keep up with the, the amount of writing that they had to do with his class. Um, so we had him reevaluated privately and we're getting him occupational therapy for um, his diagnosis was lack of coordination. So it's just a very general you know, he looks a little clumsy, he runs a little funny, um, but again, he's super smart, um, really creative, really empathetic. Um, so if you didn't know that he needed a little extra help, he wouldn't get it. So we paid privately for it. And um, in the fall, um, this is now first grade, um, he got a scholarship to a special needs focused um, swimming session, which was like eight weeks. And that's one of the best things that they can do for building up their core, coordination, 
hand-eye coordination. Um, so we've been continuing with swimming, which he really likes. But it's sort of all these little things that if you weren't really comparing him to a peer that was born full term, healthy, normal, you probably wouldn't even notice. But it's a bit of a hindrance to him. And we want him to have the best that we can give him so that he can have the best to be able to succeed like everybody else. <laughs> from what we understand, from what his doctors have told us, um, Usually, if there's going to be a complication um, at the surgical site, um, they pretty much age out of that at about three. So the fact that he um, came home, was growing, you know, um, at a good pace, he outpaced his brother at about eight months old, which was um, unusual. Usually, babies that have had neck and have lost um, intestine are smaller. Yeah, it's, it's unusual for them to, but, uh, but again, his brother is a preemie with um, BPD and asthma, lung issues, so you're comparing a preemie <laughs> to a preemie. But um, yeah, he, we were thrilled when he outpaced his brother at eight months old. Um, and from what we've understood with his pediatrician um, a little bit later, the amount of intestine that he lost and where he lost it you know, what functionally actually he lost um, was probably in the best place that if you were going to have to have surgery and if you were going to have to have necrotizing enterocolitis, he had it in the best place to have the best possible outcome. So he does have some sensitivities um, to dairy and certain foods, um, but it could be especially when you got into the, you know, 30, 50% range and you, and you get into short gut, it could be exponentially worse than it is for him. Um, one of the things that you don't think about when the baby's coming home or when the baby's in the NICU is um, every time he goes in for um, a school evaluation, a physical, they ask, you know, have you ever had surgery? So forever and a day, we're gonna have to write on a form that he had necrotizing enterocolitis and he lost 20% of his small intestine at 40 years old. And we were in Florida at Disney World and he was about a year and a half and wasn't really articulate yet and got a stomach bug. You know, we could see that he was in pain and he was crying. And um, so we called the concierge um, doctor at the hotel and they sent someone to see him. And as soon as she took his, you know, brief medical history, she said, um, I think it's just a stomach bug and he's, you know, got a gas buildup, which is giving him pain. Um, but with his history, I don't want to tell you that there's nothing wrong. I think he should go to the children's hospital and get an x-ray so that we know that, nope, this is just a tummy bug. This is just, you know, creating some gas, making him uncomfortable. And there's nothing wrong, like with the surgical site, or there's nothing impacting his intestine. Um, so that was something that we had never experienced before. And, you know, had to take the rental car and go to Nemours Children's Hospital and he had to get an x-ray and of course there it was just a bug there was nothing wrong but we sort of have to have that thought in the back of our mind that he did have surgery and he did have a portion of his intestine removed so there is the possibility that you know is it just a stomach bug or is it the indication that there's something else going on um, and another piece of that is we have a family history of colon cancer in our family. Um, my grandfather had a bout of it when I was about 11, survived, lived uh, many more years, died from something totally unrelated. Um, my uncle had it um, at about uh, 56, passed away because he decided not to seek further treatment. Um, so our thought is, is, is there a predisposition that 
he just has a weaker intestine than other babies or other children. And one of the things that we asked when he was in the NICU was, what does this look like at 10, 20, 40? You know, do we need to be concerned about other um, intestinal issues like IBS or colitis or Crohn's or colon cancer? You know, is, it, is there just something in our genetic makeup that that's his weak area? And their answer was, uh, we don't know because the, the research hasn't been done on that yet. Because I've asked almost every doctor that I've talked to in the years that we've been doing this, and most of them say, hmm, I don't know. There's no research on that. So we've started um, the NEC registry, natural history registry for necrotizing enterocolitis to gather information from caregivers or um, babies that had neck um, to see what are the long-term implications of neck as babies grow into children and children into adults. And so we're hoping to be able to answer some of those questions for ourselves and for other people because there's just no, there's no information on that. Many babies didn't survive, so there wasn't um, there wasn't babies to investigate. Um, so now that um, the technology is there to support them and um, maybe catch this earlier, um, have better techniques of intervening, you're seeing more survivors. So now people are looking at um, NICU outcomes uh, in the, you know, up to three years old, meeting milestones and this kind of thing. And I think logically the next set of questions is, okay, well, you know, we've got some outcomes at two and three. What about five? What about 10? And I think that uh, the NEC registry can be a good tool for parents and caregivers to report on, you know, normal everyday um, occurrences with babies that have had NEC and you know what that means what does that look like how does that impact them if it does maybe it doesn't as they get older many of the conversations that we had when he was in the hospital was gaining insight into this disease um, and one of the things that i saw um, online was interest in research um, potentially people that had had a baby that had knack maybe Maybe they survived, maybe they didn't, but we're interested in finding opportunities to contribute to research financially, um, you know, for this disease. And it seemed like um, nobody was doing anything about this. It seemed like um, the doctors didn't know anything. But the reality was that there are a lot of doctors and researchers and neonatologists that have been looking into this disease for 50 years. Um, it's that people outside the NICU don't know about the disease and therefore don't know the inroads that have been made thus far and the opportunities for more inroads to be made um, on the exclusive human milk side, probiotics, you know, if, if you have never heard of the disease, then your natural inclination is, how come I never knew about this? How, how come no one told me about this? How come nobody's doing anything about this? It's upsetting. Um, but they are, and it's just getting them, the researchers and the doctors, getting them the attention and the funding that they need to be able to make the break, breakthroughs that patients and families need on that side. Um, we've had contact with people in the UK. Uh, there's a group in Brazil that's focused on um, psychosocial outcomes and support for families of babies that have had NEC. Um, I've had someone contact me on Facebook from Southeast Asia and she said that uh, we were the only story that she heard that had a positive outcome. 
So I don't know if it's that, I don't think that it's that there's not positive stories, but people don't hear those. Unfortunately, they hear of um, babies being lost to neck, and it's very unfortunate. Um, but I think that knowing that there are survivors and that babies can survive, even if that's potentially not the outcome that you have, um, I think that's what people are looking for. Um, and I'm glad that we can offer that. And I've heard that more than once that, you know, the information that's out there is devastating and it sounds awful. Um, but there are glimmers of hope and there, and there are babies that survive and survive and do well. Basically, the, the outcome of NAC is either the baby will recover with bowel rest and um, non-invasive treatments, um, or the, the other cohort is um, babies that have surgery and then recover like Morgan and you know are treated as normal. Um, the babies that lose more intestine and end up developing short gut then become part of the short gut community. Um, and there's not necessarily within research means to know what caused that short gut in that baby. So while they're looking at um, things related to short gut, there's not necessarily the, li the line back to they developed short gut because of the intervention that they had for necrotizing enterocolitis. You know, that's not the only reason that babies or children can have short gut, but it's the number one reason that a baby would have short gut is surgical intervention for neck.